first of all, everybody, uh, I'd like to extend my family's thoughts and prayers in a, a very difficult period of time, both for our country and internationally. Uh, I've been moved by several gestures from both my family and our Raider family recently. You know, Mark Davis donated a million dollars to the Las Vegas community to fight the coronavirus. Uh, our first round pick a year ago, Clee Farrell, donated 100000 to his hometown of Richmond, Virginia, in their eviction diversion program, helping struggling families make ends meet. Uh, and then my wife showed me the other day that four of our rookies from last year, Alec Ingold, Hunter Renfro, Foster Moreau, and Josh Jacobs, have partnered with Three Square in Vegas uh, to provide emer emergency food funds for people that need it. And just this past weekend, my son Michael was involved in feeding 3,500 healthcare workers at 10 area hospitals in Philadelphia. So my wife, Mandy, and I kind of sat back and wondered why we weren't helping. And so what we, we'd like to do, my wife and I, we'll be don donating $1,000 for each draft pick the Raiders make this year to the Clark County Delivering with Dignity program. It supports vulnerable families in the Las Vegas Valley. The cool thing is that each donation will be made in the name of the individual draft selection made by the Raiders during the 2020 draft. The Delivering with Dignity program assists people who are most at risk for contracting coronavirus. If they leave their homes, benefiting youth who are sheltered in place, the elderly, and those with underlying medical conditions. If you want more information on this program, Will Kiss can provide it after we're done today. But I think it's pretty cool. Um, tie it into the draft a little bit. We have seven picks right now, so that's 7,000. Uh, if we if we trade up and lose a couple picks, we'll keep it a minimum of 7,000. And if we trade down and get more picks, it'll go up to whatever it goes up to. So uh, Mandy and I are both very, very excited about it and would appreciate any potential support. Thank you. So having said all that, and it's a lot more than I usually say, uh, let's open it up to questions. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. First up, we have Jeremy Donald from the Bay Area News Group. Hey, Mike, you're about to uh, embark on a virtual draft followed by a virtual off-season program. I'm just curious if you could speak to sort of the, the challenges of that and whether, you know, such a, li a potentially limited off-season, what kind of effect will that have on the players that you bring in? And, and are some positions more difficult than others, like, say, quarterback? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, you know, first of all, as far as the draft is concerned, I, I kind of laugh because everybody's talking about this virtual draft and how high tech it is. If you could see my living room right now, it's the ultimate in low tech. I've got five what, huge whiteboards and I probably have a thousand magnets with names on them all over the place. So I kind of feel like I'm sitting in the middle of a 1976 draft room and, and it's kind of back to the future. Uh, but you're 100% right. As far as the process is concerned in the draft, we've spent a lot of time on Zoom. Uh, our coaches have done an unbelievable job of pr preparing information to challenge the college player via the Zoom. Um, we I, I don't even know how many we've done so far, but it's been pretty cool spending up to an hour with each of these individual kids and getting to know them that way. So from a draft process, Jerry, um, we're all doing it the same way. You know, nobody's got an advantage, and the Raiders are 100% prepared and ready to go, and we're excited about this draft. So uh, I don't think it, it necessarily hurts anybody. We're all playing by the same rules. I think the harder thing with this draft is the medical side of it, you know, just trying to verify, especially the guys that had surgery after the new year, um, what kind of rehab they're having, uh, are they going to be in time for training camp? And then we get into the whole process of will there be a training camp? Is there any part of the off-season program that won't be virtual? And, Jerry, I think that's where it really gets tricky. Uh, and that's where I'm really happy with Coach Gruden and, and, and the coaching staff. And, you know, we, we've, they, we're going to start on April 27th so that our rookies can be involved and, and our draft picks can be involved. And, again, there's going to be a lot of meetings via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever we're going to use for that. Um, we're going to emphasize uh, the installation, the mental side of it. Uh, this is where having the right guys in the locker room, Jerry, mean a lot. You know, who's who's working out on their own? 
who's doing what's necessary to stay in shape to the extent that they can. Um, you mentioned the quarterback position. You know, we're very, very appreciative to have Derek Carr. He knows John's offense. He's going into year three of it. Uh, Marcus Mariota, you know, John and I both know him very, very well. So uh, we feel really good about the quarterback position. And uh, we feel good about the type of kids that we have in our program. Uh, the hard part is we've got a big free agency class, and we've got to kind of get them invested and up to speed as, as soon as possible. And I think that really is the trick right there. All right, Paul Gutierrez from ESPN.com. Hey, Mike, I know you said it. It seems like there's no advantage. Everybody's kind of in the same boat as far as the virtual aspect of things. But here, but given your history as a virtual GM for all 32 teams for the NFL Network, how much more comfortable then are you heading into this virtual draft as the GM of one team? Because you, you know you have experience in kind of dealing with this kind of thing anyway, in terms of not having that face-to-face time uh, like you would anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, a virtual GM for 32 teams, huh, Paul? That's <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I, that's a fancy way of saying I sat in my living room and watched a lot of film. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I, I think the thing that's – I think you have two decisions to make. You can go one or two ways here. When, when the NFL decreed what was going to happen here, I think you either embrace it and say, this is pretty freaking cool that we're going to we're really just going to watch film and trust who we are as evaluators and trust in who we want in our building. Uh, or you can kind of look at it and say, oh, well, I, I don't have verified medicals and I don't have verified 40s. I don't have verified height, weight, speed and panic about it. And I think we've kind of as a as a team, as a building, we've collectively said we're going to embrace it. And, and to be honest with you, maybe for me personally, Paul, part of it is it is kind of what I've done for the last 20 years. It, it truly is. I feel very comfortable sitting at my dining room, crunching tape, calling college coaches, and, and looking to get any advantage and any information I can on every guy we're interested in. So um, it's a really good question. And to be honest with you, we're just, as a group, we're embracing it. I, I think it's been a great process. Okay, next up is uh, Vinny from Las Vegas Review Journal. Hey, Mike, um, you guys are pretty active uh, in free agency, checking off some boxes, especially uh, defensively. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, the, you know, what you guys were able to do specifically at linebacker. Also, how did Rod Marinelli, Marinelli fit into that, especially with your defensive line acquisitions? And do you feel like you've put yourself in a, in a pretty strong position being now, now transitioning to the draft? Yeah, Vinny, I think what we've been able to do um, is is spread around the money a little bit in free agency to plug some holes, especially on the defensive side of the ball that needed to be plugged. And we've done it with guys that are both young and have uh, a consistent amount of, of playing ability, and a lot of them have been starters. So, you know, you talk about the linebackers. Corey Littleton covers as well as anybody in the league. We, we, we feel like Kwiatkowski uh, will wear the green dot and fit in seamlessly with what we do. Um, Carl Nassib plays just like Farrell and Crosby. He's 6'6", 275. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get off the bus with three long, powerful, tough defensive ends. He'll fit right in. And Malik Collins, you know, Rod obviously coached him last year, and Rod jumped up on the table in support of what this kid can be. And the cool thing about it, is, and a couple of them may have had birthdays. I, I think all of them are 26 years old right now. Uh, so we got four potential starters. All of them are plus or minus 26 years old. Uh, and it really enhances who we are in our defensive front. And then on the back end, we get Jeff Heath, who started an awful lot of football games for the Cowboys, and Demarius Randall, who, when he came out, uh, of Arizona State, I thought he was the number one free safety in that draft. So, again, we got another young player in Randall. we got Heath from experience. And I think what it does is it allows us to go into the draft on the defensive side of the ball and just kind of say, okay, you know, where's the best football player? Let's go get him. Thank you, Scott Bear from uh, NBC Sports Bay Area. Hey, um, uh, Mike, um, 
it was on the it, it was on the uh, NFL draft's third day last year where where where, where uh, you were able to pick up a number of instant impact players. Was there anything from that day or um, any um, any uh, particular pick that really stands out to you in terms of getting Crosby or Hunter or uh, Foster? Uh, anything that really stands out of, from uh, that day? Scott, I'll tell you what stands out is just kind of learning a lesson, and, and it's not an easy one, especially in your first draft, and, and that is just uh, having to be patient and the power of patience. And we had talked about moving up a couple different times throughout the first two or three rounds. Uh, we talked it through. We decided not to do it. Uh, and, you know, we got in the second round. We traded back twice and still got the one player we wanted, Trayvon Mullen. Uh, it, it gave us some extra picks on the third day. Uh, we traded back two times again in the fourth round uh, and then traded up in the fifth round to come get Hunter Renfro. So, I think the, uh, the the one thing I learned uh, is that even though I wanted to be impulsive, I, I think that uh, it helped that John and I talked everything through and, and kind of decided to be patient. Uh, and ultimately, we let the draft come to us a little bit. And through that process, we generated two or three extra picks that turned into pretty good football players. So um, you know, obviously, you want to be aggressive. And uh, you you want to go after the players you want, but in hindsight, uh, on the third day, you know you get Max Crosby at 106. You know we think Isaiah Johnson, who's a fourth round pick, has a chance to be very good. Uh, Foster Moreau had a heck of a season as a rookie till he got hurt, and and Hunter Renfro as a fifth round pick, you know had a big year in a slot. So, you know I think a lot of people get fired up, and the mock drafts are all about the first round and. You know, people scream and yell about who the quarterbacks are. But at the end of the day, to me, the third day is just as important as the first. And so is the acquisition of the college free agents. All right, Vic Taper from The Athletic. Hey, Mike, uh, I'm going to get back to the uh, quarterback situation. Uh, why is Marcus Mariota a good fit? And, and how do you see the QB room as a whole right now? I think the cool thing with uh, – my background and John's background is a lot of things we said and did in our past are public. So if you're Marcus Mariota and you want to know what the general manager of the Raiders thought about him before he came out or what John Gruden thought about him before he came out, all he's got to do is go back and check public records. I mean, he went through Gruden's quarterback camp on television. Um, I had him as a top quarterback in that draft. Uh, he knows that both of us believed in him coming out and still believe in him. He's got to get healthy. Um, we've got to rebuild him a little bit, just get his confidence back, build him up from the ground up. It's going to take a little bit, take a little while, I think, just to get him healthy and where he wants to be. But we're excited about the quarterback room. And, you know, I thought Marcus did a great job with uh, the first couple <clears throat> interviews he had just talking about where he was, which is he wants to support Dirk. Uh, he wants to become the best version of Marcus Mariota that he can become. And that's the way we look at it. Let's see who the best Marcus Mariota is. And in the meantime, we love what we have with our car. So uh, we're real happy with our quarterback room. We've got Nate Peterman, who played well till he was hurt. Deshaun Kaiser, a former second-round pick. So we feel like we've got a very strong quarterback room. Okay, uh, Ed Graney from the Las Vegas Review-Journal. Hey, Mike, you talked about panic compared to people who really think they're locked in and research, but – some of surmised maybe if the research isn't what it was in the past, pro days, meeting guys face-to-face, -face, that teams might be willing to come off more on these first-round picks than they have in the past and trade down if they're not completely sure or if you're locked in, you'll take the pick. Do you think this break will make that first round even more erratic or do you think it'll be kind of like the same as it's always been? I think the bigger change comes on the third day and thereafter because the first day prospects for the most part, you've got two to three years of film most of them at least were at the combine and you have at least a heightened weight, if not uh, verified 40 times, et cetera. You know, so for the bigger name guys, there are less question marks with the one exception of medical. And that's the one again, where I think most teams have the most concern. If, if, if we don't know as well as we have in year past with combine rechecks and medical, and uh, there's always been a consistency of how that was performed. So, 
I think the biggest issue early on is just the medical status of a lot of these guys. But outside of that, if you don't know these first round guys, I mean, there's plenty of tape, plenty of opportunity to get on zoom with them. Um, I think it's more kind of that third day when you start talking about guys that don't have as much tape, guys that don't have verified guys that were not at the combine. Uh, we're getting an awful lot of tape and, and information from agents that, that are doing ad hoc pro days and, you know, how much of that can you trust or not trust? Um, so I think more of the question marks begin to surface the further you get into this draft. I think the first round, uh, for the most part, will be similar to most years. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Eddie, Eddie Pasco from uh, Raiders.com. Hey, Mike. You and Coach Gruden were so nimble throughout the draft last year, trading and, and moving around, especially later in the draft. Do you think that given the constraints this year in terms of who's allowed to be where, do you think that will have any impact on, it, on if you guys are able to do that if you so choose? I hope there's no impact, uh, Eddie. I, uh, I've got to spend some time later this week once we get all our telecommunication stuff set up. Um, and, and I basically have to figure out, and, you know, I'm about 100 years old, so I've got to sit here and figure out how to screen share and have four different people on one screen and make sure I understand, you know, if, if there are multiple trades going on at the same time, uh, how we're handling it, how we're communicating, are we texting? Can I see anything visually? Uh, so really the challenge for me, because I'm not very good at that kind of stuff, it's a lot easier when somebody's sitting across from me and passing me a note saying, hey, you know, Atlanta wants to talk to you while I'm on the phone with Detroit. Um, so I'm anxious to – and I'm kind of old school in the, in the sense that I think if you practice enough at anything, you can get good at it. So I'm anxious to get – the communication stuff into my house. I'm anxious to get everybody around the country that I need to communicate with together. And I got to start practicing because uh, I'll be the first to tell you I'm clueless when it comes to sharing a screen. All right, Josh about from the Associated Press. Hey, Mike, you talked about the additions you made on defense. The one spot you guys weren't able to do much on was that cornerback. Um, where do you see that spot on the roster now? And is that something that you're hoping you'll be able to address next week in the draft? Well, I, where we are today is we feel like we've got a bunch of talented young kids that we don't know enough about yet. You know, Trayvon played really well the second half of the season. Uh, we believe that he's going to be a starter for years to come. Uh, Isaiah Johnson was a fourth round pick, former wide receiver with all kinds of physical skill set. Uh, we love his traits. Uh, he got hurt early. We brought him back late. He's a guy we can't wait to see play. Uh, Keyshawn Nixon was a free agent out of South Carolina that made the team and, and played well on special teams. He's a really competitive young man. Uh, and Dylan Maben is another kid out of Fordham who got hurt uh, and didn't get a chance to show what he could do. So, we, we've got four or five young corners who we're kind of intrigued by. Now, do we think we need to get better there? Yeah. But you always have to be careful to see how the, how the board falls. I think the biggest mistakes people make uh, is trying to reach for need. So the, the board will fall whatever way it falls. And if we're fortunate enough to get a corner, that'd be great. All right. Uh, one more before we open it up to, to everybody else. MJ Acosta from NFL Network. Hi, Mike. Um, you mentioned in the combine and over several months that there are needs to fill sort of all over the roster, but one glaring one was certainly at the wide receiver position. With the amount of talent that there is at wideout in this year's draft, is that a position that you, you could possibly take a closer look at compared to others? Well, I, I think wideout this year is pretty cool. And the comment I made at the combine was in a typical year, and you know the, the, the average is 12 to 13 wide receivers, typically get drafted in the first three rounds of the draft over, over the last five years. And I think you could have plus or minus 20 of them that are graded that way. I'm not saying they'll go that way, but they're certainly graded that way. So there are a bunch of guys at the top end of the draft that are considered first round. Um, there are going to be guys in the fourth round that typically would go in the third round or earlier. So there's quality at the top. There's depth throughout. There's no secret that we need to get better at wide out. We understand that. Um, we really like adding Nelson Aguilar. 
but we still need to get better at wideouts. And, and again, it's kind of like the corner conversation. I think you got to let it come to you a little bit. And whether it's in the first round, second round, third round, fifth round, uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can find a wideout that fits what the what the Raiders need and fits our culture. Okay, thanks everyone. We got about five more minutes left with Mike. So if there's anybody with uh, some outstanding questions, just speak up and uh, try to be respectful of one another, and we'll try to get it all in. Hey, hey Mike. Mike uh, this, is, this is Tishon Reed from the Go Athletic. Ahead, um, hey, Mike. I just want to ask, how do you go about the process of determining positions where you, you may not need a starter, but you can benefit from drafting players who can provide some, some competitive depth later on? Yeah, I think that got a little bit convoluted, but I think you're talking about how, how do you go about looking for uh, not necessarily starters, but depth position. Somebody's right. got their uh, – if, if you guys could turn it on mute, it would really help because I'm getting some really bad feedback now. Um, thank you. Um, so as far as the whole depth conversation, it's a good one. And I think it starts with, you know, where are your salary cap? Where are you when you look on your own roster a year or two down the road? Uh, where are our positions where players are getting older and making a lot of money? And at some point, where can you bring in a younger guy that may not necessarily start year one, but by year two or three begins to, to infill for the aging veteran that might be making a lot of money? And I think that's the reality of our league. That's the reality of managing a salary cap. And I think while we're all looking for starters, Let's face it, we're, we're also looking for guys that need a year or two to develop and ultimately could fit into a role for a team. Hey, Mike, this is hey, Vinny again. Um, when, you look at the, when you look at the three top wide receivers that most people have at the top of their particular boards, uh, three you know, dynamic players, but they're very unique uh, compared to each other. There's like different things that each of them do compared to each other. How much – of that evaluation becomes, you know, type of the scheme that you guys are running and how each, each of those type of players would fit into your system as opposed to just who's the better player necessarily. Well, I'm not sure which three you think are the best or which compared to which three I think are the best. Well, I would just say uh, Jerry, Judy, CeeDee Lamb, and, and Henry Ruggs, just as that, that seems to be the consensus top three. And the question is again, what? How, what, is uh, it fit they seem to be, system? yeah, yeah. They seem to be different from each other. Like there's, they're, they're all three obviously good players, but they they do things maybe three different ways, at least perception wise. So you know, when you look at their skill sets individually, how much of that becomes the fit in your scheme that you guys are doing when you evaluate well, I think, those I think, three players? Yeah, I think that's fair at every position, um, and and that's a conversation John and John and I have all the time. Is, is fit. What is the right fit? And uh, a guy could be a dynamic player uh, at any position, and you look at him and you say, but th- does he fit what we're looking for at this position? Uh, and I think you're right. I think the three guys you mentioned all have different traits. I think they're all high-level players. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of wideouts, and, and I think that's one of the things I said in, De- in December also, is, is that there's all kinds of flavors and sizes and you know, if you need a big X, there's a bunch of big X receivers out there. Do you need a guy that can play slot and Z? Yes, check. There's a bunch of them. Uh, are you looking for a wide receiver number one? There could be a wide receiver number one in the third round. And, um, again, to your point, yeah, fit's really important. Uh, I think the cool thing, though, about John's offense is, and I think what he showed last year, especially with what we did with our tight ends, John's adaptable to whomever he has. And that's the cool thing. And that's been the kind of fun thing to talk to him about the wide receivers about. What does this guy do for us What versus what does that guy do for us? John, what do you think is the best fit? Um, we've had some great conversations about it, and I'm sure we will continue to do so right up till the draft. Hey, Mike, you told us last year, I think, on this call that you – I've always been fond of picks 20 through 60. And right now you go from 19 to 80. Would you be surprised if when the draft is over that you didn't pick somebody from 20 through 60? <laughs> uh, I guess all my words come back to me in shades of mediocrity. Huh? <laughs> I do like picks 20 through 60. Uh, what's intriguing about our picks this year, obviously, is I'm very thankful to have two first-round picks. 
uh, but we have three in the third. And, and again, to me, three picks in the third is just like stealing. They're, they're, they ought to, you know, if, if, if we're doing our jobs the right way, hopefully that's three more starters. Um, could we move up to go, get one? Could we move back to get one between 20 and 60? Sure. I mean, and again, I, I, we're running through every possible scenario that we could, po- that, that we could be looking at. Uh, and we won't know till draft night or or day two or whatever. But um, I think we're always open to something that makes sense for the Raiders. And would I love to be twenty to sixty? Would we love to be twenty to sixty? Sure. But but I, I we also love twelve, nineteen, eighty, eighty one, eighty two, one twenty one, and one fifty nine. You know, so uh, it, it's all going to depend on what happens while we're on the clock and during the draft. Hey, Mike. Thank you. Any more? Any more questions for Mike, guys? Hey, Mike. Chris Matthews, uh, KLS, really quick. I was just, they were going to introduce the Las Vegas Raiders merchandise on that opening day. Have you heard? Are the are the uh, are the players getting caps? Are you, are you guys sending out uh, merchandise of these these potential picks, and they're going to throw on Las Vegas gear? Or have you heard anything? <laughs> Chris, you asked the wrong guy, man. I have no idea about merchandise. I have no idea. I mean, I got enough problems trying to figure out who to take at 12. So you're going to have to talk to Will about that one, okay? All right. Thank you. <laughs> Mike, what's, what's hey, the process for the, guys, for the guys who were ended the elite year injured, and the guys at Costa Moreau and some others who were in their rehab? Are, how much contact are you guys able to have with them? And, and what, just what's that process like? I'm sorry. I, all I heard was Foster Moreau. Guys on re- guys who ended the year injured uh, and are rehabbing, like like Foster. Yeah. What's the process of, of contact with those guys, and and what's the status of some of those guys? Yeah, we're, we're our medical people are allowed to talk to them, which they do. Uh, Foster's doing really well. He's been in Baton Rouge. Obviously, he's an LSU guy, and he's rehabbing. Been rehabbing there at LSU. Uh, he's ahead of schedule. Um, if you know the kind of kid that Foster Moreau is, you know he's working his tail off and. Uh, if anybody can come back and be ready for training camp coming off that ACL, it's going to be Foster. He's done great. Hey, Mike, I want to ask you about the signing of uh, Jason Witten. Is it fair to say that wasn't really an area of need? Here's the way I look at it, and I think John and I looked at it the same way. Um, if there's a, a Mount Rushmore of NFL tight ends, he, he's on it. And I know he's 37 years old, and I know we have a pretty good tight end room. But when you talk about bringing in a guy like him, not only can he still play, I think he had he had over 60 catches, he'll block the backside C gap. He's still a competitive football player. But on top of that, he brings this wealth of knowledge about how to be a professional. And you guys get tired of me talking about foundation players last year and, and, and the locker room and, and, and culture. And that's who this guy is. He, he's, he's the quintessential culture guy and we plug him in our locker room and we've got one more veteran that can look around the room and tell people with all his experience what to do and what not to do show people what to do and what not to do and even more importantly in the tight end room you get a guy like foster coming off an acl hopefully he's going to be 100 percent day one but if he's not we, we've got a conventional Y that can play Plus, we've got a guy in that tight end room that I think is going to help the young guys. And I'm talking about all of them, Darren, Foster, Dirk. I mean, John and I looked at this. with We're joined at the hip on this decision with Jason Witten. We just thought it was too good an opportunity both for our locker room and for our tight end room. And by the way, the guy can still play a little bit. More for Mike. Anybody want, want one more? Hey, uh, Mike, it's, it's yeah. not there. Um, I, 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 I was curious uh, when it came to, uh, when it came to signing um, um, Demarius Randall, is he going to be a safety for you or, 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 or given his, his, his experience um, at, 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 at outside corner, could that be an option where, uh, where do you see him fitting in? Yeah. I mean, that, that's one of the things when he came out of college where he had, kind of that corner free safety versatility um day one he'll be a free safety 
and he'll be competing for the opportunity to, to play with John Abram and those other guys on the back end. Uh, we love the fact that he can drop down and cover a slot man to man. Uh, but initially, we'd like to see him at free safety, and I think that's that. I think that's his best position. 